Um, and thank you, Ian, for the excellent talk. So I'm I'm a dark matter physicist. So that was a I was really excited by that. Um, but I'm here to talk about something a little bit different. Um, if you will humor me, I have index cards. So I'm a relatively new instructor. So can you take a card and pass it back? And any extras I'll pick up at the back. My understanding is this is what is called active learning. So on your index card, you can fold it in half. It's not strictly necessary. On the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side, um, I would like you to write what should university physicists know about the high school students who you are educating? On the right hand side, there's a related question. What should high school teachers know? What would you like to know about the university physics environment to which you are sending your students? And you're welcome to add anything else in the bottom. You know, if you want to talk more or contact information or comments, I will pick these up at the end of lunch on this table. And people online, um, you can send me an email. Um, all right, so the prompts are, what should university physicists know about your students that only you as teachers who have known them in a certain way could, could tell us? And on the right hand side, what would you like to know about this weird, nebulous, and ever-changing university environment in which you are sending your students to be educated? All right. May I change the slide? See, I've learned enough from teaching that I should ask before changing the slide. Yes. Please do. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And so the reason why I'm asking is to talk about equity in physics. And this is a big question, you know, the question of diversity. Why is it that the group of physicists who, um, who are writing papers or who are going to graduate programs or who are teaching these classes or even the people who make it from the freshman to the sophomore year, why do they have a certain demographic that do not, does not always reflect the demographic of the state of California or the US as a whole or even your classrooms? And it is so easy to say well, maybe there's a leaky pipeline problem, right? This is a phrase that I hear often in university physics departments. There's a leaky pipeline problem. And this is a really easy thing to say because that means the leak has happened earlier and there's nothing I can do. So, okay, so I, I can, there's any number of data about different groups that are underrepresented. Um, here is just one of many plots from the APS of the percentage of women graduating with physics bachelor's degrees across different ethnicities. Um, those of you who are closer to the front can actually see, it's, these are percentages. If you look at the actual numbers in the bars, um, the, the raw numbers are actually much low, also scale differently um, by bin. I wanna make one quick point that there are different ways in which one can be a minority. It's not just gender, it's not just ethnicity. And the different ways in which one are a minority often multiply, often exponentiate. But when I talk about diversity in physics, I really mean the plethora of different ways in which one can be diverse. And the question of why this is, is a challenging one. From a physics point of view, you can say, is it the dynamics? Is it the system, the way the system works? Maybe it's initial conditions, like this leaky pipeline problem. And as an assistant professor who really every morning just wants to work on dark matter, and be able to solve these things, but who also has to see uh, our, our students, the students you send to me and the students I send on to graduate school. Um, that's a really big problem that I am not equipped to solve. So instead, there's a much humbler problem that I want to address, which is what can we, you and me in this room, what can we do now? And rather than talking about the leaky pipeline, there's at least one handoff that I think is critical. Right, the handoff between your students who are coming to our universities and who for the first time in their lives are moving from one educational culture to a completely different educational culture 
how do we make that handoff better? And this is, this is a handoff that is not incredibly well studied in the physics education literature, um, but it's one that we know is really critical in retention for not just underrepresented students, but students in physics generally. And the modest proposal is maybe this is where we start. And it's not me sitting here telling you how to do your job better, because I have no clue how to do the incredibly difficult job that you do. But there's a dialogue where I am itching to know how do I better prepare our freshman physics courses for the types of students who you're sending to us. And if there's anything I can tell you about what our, our programs are like, uh, where it is that th these issues of retention show up, where it is that a given student might feel like, oh, maybe I don't belong here. Right, so the goal is inclusive training at the undergraduate level, which is our job, and preparation for whatever that training is, which is somehow your job. That's how I envision the handoff. Now, there is a perfect audience to, to, to mediate this discussion. The perfect audience are your alumni and my current undergraduates. Does anyone know why this is not the perfect audience? Yeah, so, so I remember when I was an undergrad and everyone has whatever road bumps it is on their path. The last thing I was gonna do is go to my high school science teacher who happens to be here and say, you know this, this, this subject physics that you have instilled a passion for in me, that, that I am so excited that you have sent me off to this great university to, to study. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I belong. You were the last person I would come back to to say, hey, I'm, I'm having a rough time. Nor are they gonna come to the, their faculty mentor who they know in a couple of years will be writing their letters of recommendation for graduate school. So on top of this being a really thorny thing to talk about, we're not even talking about physics, right? By comparison, neutrinos and dark matter is easy. Talking about culture and society and systemic issues, that's really thorny, that's a difficult conversation. How do we actually have this conversation in a helpful way? So the one modest proposal, um, I took some inspiration for my other hobby, which is reading popular science books. Um, I run a book club. And bear with me, this sounds completely unrelated. I run a science book club at a local independent bookstore, Cellar Door Books in Riverside, California. And we read popular science books. Our audience is a mix of people who are, range from professors of the university who are specialists in their field to people in the community who have never taken a university a science course of any type. And in that context, talking about current research in science is really difficult. And it's not that the science is difficult, it's that it's really hard to find the common ground to have a meaningful discussion. And what's really great about this, this forum is every month we pick a book, here are some of our favorites. We all read the book, the book is geared at the public audience and we come together and we talk about it. And even the tenured professor who knows all sorts about a particular field and the person who has no formal education in science can speak productively because the book itself is a common ground. Whether you're saying, I don't understand that, or in my experience, this is the way it works, or um, you know, this author is really lousy, or this author is amazing because of the way they explain this. Right? The moment you can actually have a tangible common ground, then you can have productive conversations at whatever level is appropriate for the group. So right now, if I were to sit down with, with any of you and say, tell me why it is that there aren't more black women in physics, that will be a really terrifying conversation. Right? So the first step is how do we establish this common ground? And inspired by this forum, one thing that we have tried at UC Riverside is to have a book club. So we run a one week's uh, physics summer teacher academy. Um, it's, uh, we fund teachers to spend one week at, at UC Riverside. Uh, they talk about pedagogy, they have refreshers, a little bit about research. But 
in 2019, we tried something. We sent each one of those teachers a copy of The Only Woman in the Room. This is a memoir by Eileen Pollack, who was the first woman to graduate from Yale Physics in the 70s, the first. Um, and it was just a personal story about her journey, what it was like being the only woman in that department, or one of two, in fact. And uh, I think the format that we had was a, a one-hour discussion between small groups of teachers, faculty, and graduate students, um, and a panel with some of our graduate students uh, and staff. And I think this worked really well. Right? All of these barriers of you are the expert at something, and I am teaching um, these students. All of the barriers of I, it's been so long since high school, I forgot what high school is like. All of the barriers of I am not equipped to speak about um, issues of gender and, and physics. I can just talk about dark matter. All those things break down because you have something to hold on to to frame those discussions. Um, in fact, one of the really cool things that came out of this last session was graduate students for the ideal vessel. Right, graduate students are far enough removed that they felt some of these initial bumps of, of what makes being in academia difficult. But they also have enough distance where they recognize what things are systemic and which things are, are, are on their own, right? They're less, they're more willing to speak frankly, both to teachers and to their advisors about what's going on, right? So, so this is the proposal. Um, what I would like, the reason why we're doing this active learning exercise is I would like to learn from you, how do we do something like this at a future KITP teachers conference? Or how do we start using this framework? Because the fact that we're, we have this face-to-face -face time is so precious. Like I, I've really been enjoying, this is my first teachers conference. It's been really fantastic. Um, and is, is this the right framework or forum to do something like this? Um, I can say that there, there are bigger visions. You can imagine how this could grow. I think the, the one product I would like to eventually have is a book club in a box, kind of a kit that we can make publicly available for other universities to, to mimic this with their local communities. Um, wouldn't it be great if this could turn into a network where you have a group of, say, districts or, or places with universities and, and local high schools where you could agree to read the same book? Um, and even having an ecosystem pointing out, here's a very important handoff, high school to, to college, um, that by the way, there's a reason why this, this handoff is hard to study. Um, this is because doing any human subjects research in social science is really hard with anyone over under 18. And so if we have this network, this is something where I could imagine there being physics education researchers and social scientists who would say, hey, Given that you have this framework, I can get you the Institutional Review Board approval, and we can, we can learn more about this in a formal setting. Is anyone really skeptical yet? Like, I mean, maybe the idea of free books sounds great. So I, I think one thing that I, I has, is not often shared, especially with, with your community, is that there are incentives for this from the top down. So the National Science Foundation, which funds a lot of fundamental research, um, when you apply for a grant, has this thing called broader impacts. And I think this wall of text here is probably some semi-official definition for what broader impacts means. If taxpayers are going to fund our research, how is that funding going to give back to society? And I've highlighted a few things here, but the point is, the NSF really likes the idea of supporting researchers who are able to use their position to also uplift the educational pipeline, uh, address issues of equity in physics, and have these you know, well-defined societal impacts. Oftentimes, the bottleneck is that the researcher is also um, excited to attend these KITP workshops, which are really fantastic, um, balancing their research time, writing other grant proposals, and teaching their undergraduates. And they don't have the, the bandwidth or know that have the connections to connect to the actual teachers who are critical for this handoff. So just to say that, that there are ways that, I, that this can happen. You know, there is a will for this to happen, um, but to build this connection really has to start at the ground level.
Okay, so the other thing I've learned is when you give an assignment, you remind people. So note cards on the one side, what should university physicists know about the students who are you are sending off? On the other side, what would you like to know to better prepare your students for going to university physics departments? Um, please deposit your note cards here and I will pick them up at the end of lunch. All right, thank you very much. Very inspiring, Flip. Very, very inspiring. Questions, comments? Okay, go ahead. Hi, Flip. That is, this is fabulous. I, and I love your idea of the book club. Thank you. I, this is great. I'll talk more about it later. Um, but I think the question here, what, my, when I look at the, what do high school teachers need to know about the university physics department? I mean, you know, my personal opinion is, you know, physics, the patriarchy is still seriously in control. And, you know, your kids need to be ready for that, which is maybe not helpful, but it's truth. So what I want, but I wanted to ask you though, in a more positive way is there are other disciplines with the same problem who are making, has in the last 15 years have made real progress, tweaked things to make other groups more welcome and it's it's moving and i guess i'd be interested if you have things to say about about that too which encourages me greatly um, are we being recorded <laughs> so, yes, so, so 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 <laughs> both things i mean your, your first point about the statement physics is a patriarchy right so i will not commit to an opinion about that but i think that's exactly the type of thing that needs to be communicated and, and even if going away from here's an absolute, if there is a perception of this, that needs to be communicated. What is it that we give to buttress our students against what they're going to perceive? Um, the second question was, other fields seem to do, be doing a lot better. And this is absolutely true. Uh, some of the APS data even shows this saying, it's so easy to say, but computer science must be equally bad. It's not. Um, and I don't have any deep insights on that, but I, I, th there is something about physics where, where learning more about this is, is really timely and really critical. So thank you. So first of all, thank you for your prompts. I think they're really great. Um, I just wanna make two comments. Um, I teach in an all girls school and I can tell you that over the last, I would say 10 years, the number of students that have gone into like computer science, physics, chemistry has increased and their stick to itiveness in those majors in colleges and undergrad has also increased. So we see less students saying, I wanna major in say physics and then dropping out after their freshman mm -hmm. year. And I think part of that, and I'll just pat our students on the back a little bit, um, is we really work with them to make them confident learners so that whatever situation they're in, and we always go back to Seymour Papert's line that students should be able to solve any problem they've never seen before as, a pro as opposed to a problem they have seen before. And I think that's really helped. We also bring in a lot of our alum to have conversations mm -hmm. with, our peer, uh, with our students as well. I would also direct you, and I put it on my card, have a conversation with the National Coalition of Girls Schools. Hmm. They do a lot of work in this area. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about it at lunch, but I put my contact That's information. Awesome, um, thank you. But they'd be a great people, they're a great group to talk to about this. So. I, I also really like your point about the alumni might not talk to us, frankly, but they will talk to the next generation of students. Thank you. Hello. Uh, it's me. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. I agree with you 1000%. Okay, you're right, dead on. My issue is, you know, kids come into my classroom from, I don't work in a, what's called a unified district, K through 12. I work in a, a, a 9 through 12. So I have no clue where they're at scientifically mm. when they walk in my door. And I think spiraling science education from K or pre-K all the way through school 
would be a great start where you agree on these are the things I'm going to talk about. I had a student who was in my class, but she was from Russia. And she showed me her eighth grade physics notebook. <laughs> she blew away every single kid <laughs> in that class, I mean, in eighth grade, mm -hmm. because they were serious about it. I think, number one, it has to start really early with the same concepts, just easier and easier. Uh, number two, uh, you know, I didn't, I took physics, I mean, I got physics, but I, where I went to college, undergrad physics was terrible. I mean, here's the problem, solve it, right? <laughs> pretty much. My younger brother's got a bachelor's degree in physics, and he's a poli-sci professor. That'll tell you where he was <laughs> at on physics. Um, they need to do a better job of reaching out to students. And we all, everyone in the room agree, you know, the teacher makes all the difference in the world. Instead of having one section a week, having two or three sections a week. Provide multiple opportunities for them to get tutoring in college. Because it's daunting, right? And it's hard. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, and again, I agree with what was said prior. Man, the last 10 years, uh, my, the young ladies in my class blew away most of the boys in that class. They were way better at everything. <laughs> and so it's happening. But um, there's like ridiculously amount of more work that we could do, both individually but also nationally, to make that happen. Thank you. So um, I really, really like physics because if your student becomes a physicist, he can do anything. Dr. Waldo Lyons was a physicist that allowed the Nautilus to go underneath the, underneath the ice to the North Pole. And I had another physicist that worked there that he was on a submarine and his computer broke and he was able to take it apart and fix it. And I, I needed to talk to you about that because you also do chemistry, right? Physics, physics. I physics personally is, definitely do not do chemistry. Yeah. I, I have, oh, oh, and but, I have to say that because I have colleagues in the back of the room who are all, looking at me. <laughs> yeah. It's such a wide spectrum of stuff that physicists can do that it's really amazing. Hey, other, other questions for Flip. Questions oh, for Flip. Let's go ahead. I got a bunch on this side. Do you have one? Okay. Um, so probably about 12 years ago, I had the opportunity to be a, I would say, a teacher connect between a local university and my high school. Um, I had a sabbatical which paid me half of my salary and the college paid the other half of my salary for that year. And my job was to work with the students that were in the introductory calculus and physics classes and uh, try to make a bridge so that I would know a little bit more about what was going ah. on there. And uh, then I would have discussions with the professors and what was needed and so on. So I was that contact person for these students to say, hey, this is not going well. And this is going well. And it was a, an eye-opening experience. Um, and I wrote down some of the, the things mm -hmm. here, but I think that that was such a great opportunity if there's any colleges that could do that. I think it, I hope it made a difference. That's excellent. Is that a program or is there information about that, that program? Um, I could share with you. It hasn't gone on since that, but when I get home, I could take your email address and share with you some. It was called a teacher fellowship is what they called it. Thank you. Um, yeah. But they had, I think, two years of it and then the money went away. And so the program went away, but it was really good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, when I was here three years ago, there was a gentleman that talked about a program called Step Up, yes. which was, anyway, it was designed, and I hadn't heard of it, it was designed to get more children involved in physics, and that appealed to me because most of my demographics were about 50-50. And as someone else mentioned, my female students, I've had much more success recruiting to go on to uh, careers in physics than, than most of, of the guys. So I got involved and I wanted to raise the question of have you looked at some of their data? Because in working with them to become an ambassador, they 
addressed a number of these questions. So it leads me to think there is some research that you can look at that gives a, there's data out there you can look at already besides what's available in this room. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, and they also developed three lessons. The one that sticks to me the most is women in physics. And it was all about having people look at them as role models. And it didn't matter whether the students were male or female in the class. It was like, what is it about this person that you admired? And look what you have in common and see since we're alike. You could be like that person too if you wanted to be. That was the kind of the essence of the lesson. And all of those things sounded good. The thing I wanted to question or share is as an ambassador, my role was to help take that message out. And two things struck me about doing that. I remember holding three workshops to, to share these lessons with other teachers, the total attendance of which for all three was mm. zero. Mm. Um, so that raised a question in my mind of, okay, what am I doing wrong in recruiting? But the other question of why would there not be a desire for people to want to be there? So that, and I don't have the answer to that. Why, if someone has your passion, why isn't that person in my room listening to someone who's already, we've done the work, here's a product, take it and run with it. And yet there was no one in the audience. So I don't, I, there's a gap there that I don't think is research. Um, and the other one was when the teachers would come, there was a lot of, can I call it but feedback? That's what I like to call <laughs> yeah. it. Not this kind of but, yeah. the but, but, but. Yeah. And that's what I call it. It's but feedback. It's a great idea. And then followed by all these reasons why I'm probably not going to do it. Um, so I just wanted to share if you'd heard of Step Up and maybe that'll help you in your research. Yeah, and I can tell you from being an ambassador that there is a gap between commentary and commitment. Absolutely. So for everybody else, this is the APS Step Up program. It, it started about five years ago. So yeah, thank you. Uh, shouldn't these efforts really be directed more towards middle school? I mean, <laughs> Sorry, I, where, where am I looking? I'm, I'm oh, right thank here. You. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit it. I teach middle school. I'm not so a high school teacher. All right. Yeah. And my eighth grade physics, I'll put up against any freshman class. All right. But the, that's not the deal. The, you know, by middle school, by the time they get to high school, it's often too late, right? So, so, so where are the resources for the middle school? Great. This is an excellent point. And Inez and I were just talking about this at the coffee break. And the answer to your question is yes. Yes, it should be, do, be done at middle school. It should be done at elementary school. It should be done at a public level. I am not equipped to do that. And I, I, I know, I mean, what I am equipped to do is interface with our freshmen. And the handoff that I, I see and experience and feel like I can make a contribution to is that later handoff. Granted, once you make that handoff, you've already integrated over elementary school, junior high, most of high school, everything is happening there. And I absolutely agree that that's something ought to be done. I am not the right person for that. But, but your point is absolutely salient. Uh, yeah, my, my point is that we're kind of asking the wrong audience. Everybody in this room probably studied physics at some point. So I'm a woman and I went into physics because my grandpa worked at Hughes and my dad was a physics major. So there's, there's a couple of things you need to be asking. You need to ask the people who are of a minority, why are you in physics? Mm -hmm. And then you need to talk to the, all the women as bio majors. Why did you pick bio instead of physics? All the women who are an English major, why did they all, most of them, either took it in high school or why didn't you take it in high school? So I think we need to get more data from the people that we're talking about instead of us trying to figure out why other people aren't doing things that we'd like them to do. Um, we should talk to them of what motivated people who actually went into physics and what unmotivated people who left or didn't go into it. Yes, thank you. So, so and I'll, can I split your question, your point to the two points? One is the hard data and, and people are taking hard data on this and a lot of it's in the physics education research community. Um, the second part of, of, of your, your point is this information is also anecdotal. And usually in the sciences, with the anecdotal data, anecdotal evidence is not data. But in this case, these stories that people tell are incredibly powerful and oftentimes are as salient as any numerical data. And this is partly why things like reading Eileen Pollock's book was particularly powerful. 
But yeah, thank you. Um, hi. So one of the things when students go from high school to college, and I think there's probably studies about this, the way that they teach in college, like 200, 300, 400 students in a lecture with the lecture based, uh, I'm pretty sure studies show that's not effective. <laughs> No, I mean, it sort of might explain why you're getting some loss. So I just wonder, like, I know not all universities are doing that, but like what's being done at that level, if you kind of already know that doesn't work, but that seems like still the standard. I'm absolutely the first person to say, if you gave me 15 students, life would be so much better. I'm sure most of you would agree with that. Um, given the, so that's another big problem that I'm not equipped to solve. But I think what I, what I am about that problem is, why is it disproportionately hitting some students, some groups of students more than others? Okay, uh, let's thank Flip one more time.